Fantastic. I have the extreme pleasure of introducing to you the woman, the myth, the legend, Ms. Sheridan Stewart, who has just about done everything. She happens to be the author of this amazing book. She's been on Triple J, Fox FM, has been on SA FM, and is currently um, broadcasting to the, is it the central coast of, of Queensland? The Sunshine Coast. But, I um, beg your yeah, pardon, central yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm so sorry for the inability to do live tonight. There's been all kinds of technical problems. This is the very first time that we have ever done a Zoom call. I am in Metro Adelaide and Sheridan happens to be all the way up in far north Queensland. Welcome, Sheridan Stewart. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm here on um, Durrambul country in the Capricorn Coast region. So normally I'm on the Sunshine Coast. And of course I spent many, many years in Adelaide and still have a very strong heart pull to Adelaide. Um, loved, loved my time at Adelaide. I was at Triple M for a decade, which is a significant period in radio careers. There's of course a, a handful of people that have had very long careers in the one place. Mostly people move around a fair bit. So I was lucky to, to have had that time of, you know, a really solid time in Adelaide. It was wonderful. And then I did the Adelaide Fringe for nearly a decade as well. So, yeah, Adelaide is heart country. How was Queensland able to steal you away? Was that a matter of uh, the weather? Uh, did they just make you an offer in the mob that they say that you can't refuse? The weather's probably the reason I would stay. It's not what I came for. I came here as part of a redeployment. So I'd um, taken a position in Mildura. So just um, a five short, four and a half, five hour drive from Adelaide. And I thought I'd be there for a couple of years and then, you know, move to wherever. Uh, but what happened was there was a, you yeah, know, there's been a few now, but a, a realigning within the ABC. It was during the LNP government. There were very big budget cuts and they changed the whole structure. So I ended up on the Sunshine Coast as a redeployment, possibly one of the best redeployments in the country, though, if you've got to be shunted off somewhere, um, you know, most people would have seen that as an upgrade. Having said that, if you ever get a chance to spend time in Mildura, it is an extraordinary place. You know, this beautiful town on the Murray River that is, it's like a tri-state place. You know, South Australia is just a few kilometres away. And I had the privilege of working in Victoria and Mildura. And then I'd drive home across the bridge and within five minutes I'd be at home in New South Wales. So and weekends, you know, back home in Adelaide. So home was, you know, became a very loosey-goosey term. I remember very fondly driving through Mildura. Uh, that's where basically New South Wales becomes Victoria, if I remember. Was it the, yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, it's just stunning. It's absolutely gorgeous uh, going. Um, both are, they have highlights and they have low lights, but the scenery is just shockingly beautiful um, in that part of the world. It really is. It's very different. You know, it's a different type of beauty. The Mallee is very distinctive. And, you know, I know the whole ethos behind your podcast and the reason why we do this, David, is, you know, that it's the people that make a place. And, the people of Mildura are by and large exceptional. You know, there's some incredible artists, there's artisans, there's incredible food culture and, and a coming together of people who in a fairly small community, you can have your clashes and things can go wrong and you have to put that all aside and work side by side with that person, you know, whether it's months or years, years down the track. There is no avoiding anyone or anything in in a town like that, but you know, the cream definitely floats to the top and I had an exceptional time there. Yeah. Sure, not, not only do I try to uh, highlight Australians who are perhaps average, that are doing above average things or above average pe uh, people who are doing exceptional things, but I also try to ask questions that nobody else has. I'm really struggling with this one because you've had some amazing interviews with some amazing people. Um, and uh, a lot of the questions that I normally ask uh, have already been asked. So um, if it's okay with you, um, because I know that um, 
that a large portion of the people that uh, follow me wouldn't have met you, uh, don't know very much about you, and I'll try to interject some unique stuff in, uh, but tell us about you as an individual. Um, did you always know that you wanted to be an author, that you wanted to be a producer, a director uh, on radio? How, how did all of this craziness start? Mm -hmm. The, the author part goes back a long, long way. So when I was a child, I was always writing stories, illustrating stories, often, um, you know, highly plagiarised because you're a child and you're mimicking and you, yep. you read something you love, you know, things like Green Grass of Wyoming or My Friend Flicker or Dream of Fair Horses or The Silver Brumby. There was a lot of horses in my, in my early work, shall we call it. Um, but I got the idea at age 11 that I wanted to make a film. And I don't know where the idea came from. I just knew I wanted to make a film. And I grew up in a family that we didn't, have a lot as in you know it was a single income family and that later became a single mum no income family but both my parents never discouraged anything so whilst nothing was handed to me on a silver platter the idea was if I wanted to do something they would let me make it happen and assist where appropriate so I got the phone book out, rang the Australian Film Commission and said, hello, I'm Sheridan Stewart and I'd like to make a film. And they're like, how old are you, dear? And I'm, well, I'm 11. And it's like, we don't normally give grants to 11 year olds, but there is a, you know, an application process. And we have a, uh, a thing called an experimental film grant. So these are the smaller films that are in the hundreds rather than the thousands of dollars. And I, I arranged a meeting and I went and met with um, the head honchos there and my father drove me there and I had a chat with them and then I came home and, you know, I was the auteur, you know, the Rolf de Heer of the 11-year-olds. I wrote the script, I directed it, I had the starring role. I did the whole hoot and caboodle because it didn't occur to me that I couldn't. It, it awesome. didn't occur to me that I wouldn't get the grant, the starters. Of course, there was very little chance of that, no guarantee. But I think um, I was speaking to Benjamin, his surname will come back to me at some point, um, an, a, an amazing Australian um, with a, a Chinese-Korean background, I think it is. And he was, I was interviewing him once about leadership. So I was doing on the ABC a national broadcast for New Year's Day a couple of years ago and I decided well if I'm going to be broadcasting on New Year's Day it's the beginning of a new year I'll make the theme leadership what do we want from our leaders what's missing from our leaders and what do we need to embrace and he said maturity and audacity you know audacity so I think as a child I had that audacity that fearlessness that um, not all of us have innately. Some of us have to develop it. We can all find it. We can all, you know, draw it, you know, from somewhere within ourselves and we can all be encouraged. We can encourage each other to develop that audacity and kind of go for it, you know. Put your hand up and, you know, people ask me, how did I get an international book deal? The very short answer is I press send. Oh, and the years in between, oh, <laughs> sorry, the years in between getting that film grant and pressing send and even getting into radio had a similar audaciousness where I didn't have that much knowledge of radio. So I didn't have a lot of noise in my head that was saying you can't do this or that this is going to be hard or that it's such a long shot. So sometimes having a little naivety on your side can really help. When we know that we're about to, you know, run a marathon against Kathy Freeman, then chances are we're petrified and we have trouble getting out of the starting block. So, you know, <laughs> with some of these, these things, it's been much harder at this midlife point to put those voices aside and all the logic aside and just press send. But that's still at the end of the day what you need to do if you want to get your work out into the world. That's absolutely motivating uh, well done well done i guess it's similar to myself in that um 
everybody said to me, David, why are you going to start a podcast? It's been done to death. Everybody and their dog in Adelaide has a podcast, um, you know, and they started listing names. This person has one, that person has one, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then, I don't know, I think it was two weeks ago, two weeks ago. Yes, it was two weeks ago. And I had a phone call from one of the naysayers. And I said, like, how did you get Professor Furman Doko Shatoka on you, who's the leading in the world, the leading expert in a econometrics. How did you get uh, Professor Wilkinson coming on, who's the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, I think it's oneology, the expert in wines. Um, how did you get all of these amazing people? And a similar answer to yourself, I asked them. I had the audacity to, you know, hi, my name is so-and-so. Uh, I have an idea for a podcast. It's going to be centered on this. I know that you don't know me and that I don't have a name and a reputation, but it would mean the world to me if you could come on the podcast. And um, that, that's pretty much how all of that happened. So I can really identify with what you've said. Yeah. And I think there's, there's that, you know, that um, to be cliche, ask and thou shall receive. There is always that capacity that, you know, somewhere in the universe there will be an answer. And sometimes the answer is not as direct as an instant yes, but I've learned to trust my life path and say even if it's even if my imagination has got it a little bit wrong or I've sort of veered off my path a little bit, that that something I'm learning will will bring me back and that those seeds I plant will grow and some things take longer to germinate than we imagine and not everything's in our own personal time. And I think that's one of the things we um, can get a little bit tangled up in, in the Western world and Western civilization and this idea of, um, I and you see it in all the motivational, you know, sayings and they're great. You know, I've, I've been a self-help junkie from day one, but some of them are so <laughs> outrageous that <laughs> we have such high expectations of ourselves. It's like climb every mountain and, you know, reach for the stars. And it's like, well, if you would, you could for starters. And sometimes it's a matter of, I, I love this and I, I can't remember where I, I originally heard it. So, you know, please universe out there, whoever originally said this, um, give me your blessing to share it. But it's like the, um, the, the, the Pisces thing, the, you know, there's me and what I want, here's the world. And where we cross over is what the world needs from us. And sometimes yeah. when we fail or we get rejected or something's not working out in our own sense of timing, it's not that we're wrong, it's that the world might need something a little bit different from us from, from, from that, in that moment. Yeah. Well, I know so, I've gone all kind of woo-woo and spiritual on you, but no, that's I okay. think I don't mind. it's really worth holding these things in our mind that, um, yes, we are the, you know, the author of our own destiny to a large degree, but we're also co-creators. You know, we're not doing this on our own. We're doing this yeah. in unison with, um, you know, whatever you your personal belief wants to name, whether it's God or the universe or just mankind, humankind. We're, we're not our, we're not on our own in this. Otherwise, we'd be just sitting on our island and you know talking to a to a basketball that looks like a coconut. <laughs> I've never heard it put that way. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, you made your film. Uh, what was that like? I mean, all of your friends must have thought. Did, did you all of a sudden have a million friends who were holding up no, their hand? I want to be in the it film. Was the opposite, David. No, it was the absolute opposite. What? My eleven-year-old friends had no idea what to make of it. Wow. Australia. You know, we're talking about the gosh. You know, the the late seventies. We're talking about tall poppy syndrome and my friends didn't know which way to look they never asked me about it they never mentioned it um media came to the school it was a bit awkward and embarrassing and they literally never asked me about it so you know then I then I had this unusual <laughs> sort of experience between the adult world and the expectations of you know a young audacious Sheridan and friends who you know, it was like, wow, is it even, it's, is it even real? You know, did well, it even I was going to ask you about that. Did all of your friends think that you were telling porky pies? <laughs> Not really, but they'd follow me around, you know, going, movie star, you think you're a movie star? Oh, no, there was, it wasn't, it wasn't particularly pleasant, to be honest. And oh, um, I'm not laughing at you. Yeah. I'm laughing at the situation. 
you know, I look back at, you know, little 11 year old Sheridan and, you know, validation by our peers is such an important thing. It's everything so, at that age. Yeah. yeah. And I was just sort of coming into my own and we had the hot, you know, the end of primary school dance and none of the boys asked me to dance. I was oh, stuck no, on the wall. I'm so sorry. It was, That's terrible. It was awful. Yeah. It was, um, it wasn't a particularly easy thing. Um, yeah, so I had, it was like having two lives. There was my school life and my peers and then there was me in this adult world where, you know, ahead of making the film, the Australian Film Commission ran a 12-week course in King's Cross of all places. So, you know, mum or dad would drop me at King's Cross for a whole day and I would work with other, they were all adults except for me, who had either gotten the grant or had come close to the grant. So in that course, there's me at 11 and there's Brian Brown, who's gone on to become one of Australia's, you know, leading actors and, and filmmakers, and he'd missed out on the grant. So, oh, wow. you, know, it, you know, my life is full of these great stories, but everyone's life is, David. And you yeah, that's of, right. Absolutely. You flagged this when you said that, you know, you like to talk to people from all different walks of life and different yes. experiences. Yes. And the thing about radio is, everyone has a story, literally everyone. So I will be driving along and certainly being with the ABC has given me a, a massive capacity to do this. And with modern technology, you know, on my phone, there's an app and I can walk up to someone, you know, randomly and say, hey, I'm Sheridan, I work for the ABC. I'm just really curious about what you're doing here. And boom, I've got an interview. And you know, everyone literally has a story, even if you're listening to this and you think, oh, I don't. <laughs> you do. You do. Yeah, Trust me. And I, can, I can help you find it. I can dig it out of you. <laughs> it's one of the things that, um, you know, is, I guess, a skill that I've developed or maybe it's something innate that, you know, when people come into the studio, they forget that they're on the mic. You know, it's, it becomes like it is between you and I all these miles away, it's still a conversation between you and I and, you know, you, you who are listening, who are taking the time to be with us, whether live or, you know, whether it's it's um, something you listen to later on, there's still a conversation that you can actually be part of. And that energy, I think, is really important to, to remember that we're not just talking to ourselves here, you know, although that part is fun. <laughs> okay, so you, you're now this big movie star who has produced and directed. <laughs> and... <laughs> did it, did that go anywhere, or was that just a one-off? Is that something that you repeated at some stage in your life? Because I don't recall seeing that in any of your interviews or discussions. No, no, it's, I guess because it's you know historical, it's it's deep in history. But you asked where it all began, so yes. you know there it is that idea of being a writer very young and when I when I moved into radio in my 20s um, largely it was letting go of the dream of being an actor recognizing that what I really wanted to do was write and direct and I particularly like being told what to do and as an actor that is your job yeah. um, but also I got kind of pretty chubby and I felt very self-conscious and I wasn't the sort of chubby jolly you can be a comedian type of chubby. I was the, please lose some weight because, you know, you've got this nice face and we want to cast you as this, but you're too chubby. So it was it was very awkward and I heard a lot of, you know, she would be good in radio, got a nice voice. So I ended up in, in radio. I followed that cue and fell in love with it from my very first, you know, lesson. I fell in love with the, the medium of audio. It was really lovely to not have to worry about how you look to just be, I guess, more authentic without. Also, there was no TV show that I particularly had a strong desire to be part of. Um, but whether it's radio or film, and I will come full circle to a little bit of um, film work that I did, but... Um, and that was, you know, very much in Adelaide, which is, you know, the heart of the Australian film industry. Just I might be a little biased, but, you know, very, very strong filmmaking um, being still being made and, and amazing writers that live in Adelaide. It's um, a very strong creative hub. But writing is, or words at least, are, are the core of what I do. So whether it's expressing myself, whether I'm interviewing someone else, whether I'm writing a book, or a screenplay that that 
how we use our words is is at the heart of it all. So hopefully that in a roundabout way and at least symbolically answers the question. But yeah, when I was in Adelaide and I was at Triple M where I had an absolute blast, you know, I had an absolute blast. A decade in Adelaide radio, I did virtually every, every program. My favourite time slot is drive. Um, but for a long time I did afternoons and at two o'clock I'd get the lead out and play a double shot at Led Zeppelin. And I got to work with the who's who of the South Australian radio industry that were all a decade or two older than me. So when I first got there, I was like, my God, I've come to the retirement station of the nation. <laughs> and within about 10 minutes, I realised that I was surrounded by dead set legends. And that, um, I guess, elevated my position there as the the fresher voice they wanted someone who sounded little triple j's uh, they wanted a strong female presence and at that stage it was really the beginning of women in mainstream music radio before that it was very much the realm of the abc and the women in radio were a sidekick in a breakfast show it was never the core and certainly women solo, and I very much wanted to be a music present, presenter, a big passion for music. And I'm a bit of a glass ceiling. Let's break that glass ceiling. I'm going to be the first woman at Triple M to do drive time, which was the last male bastion of, you know, that kind of, um, you know, hardcore blokey rock. Um, I loved it. I had an absolute blast, but it was kind of easy, David. So in my spare time, my best friend and I, developed a writing partnership and we worked on some screenplays and it was with her Jen Wildwood her name is she's currently working with the ABC as well in a whole different area to me um, she and I really developed our our craft skills around writing together so that um, that was a very valuable time tell me about your heroes uh, everybody has heroes tell me about your role models that shaped you and formed you into the woman the great woman that you are now <laughs> oh wow good question um i have an unusual collection of of people who i would look up to certainly in radio there were no women in fm music radio at the time that i could really look up to um uh, in the world of film, I mentioned him before, Adelaide's own Rolf de Heer, extraordinary auteur filmmaker. Um, yeah, Barry Humphreys was someone who I thought was extraordinary and probably my all-time favourite interview. I was doing breakfast radio in Canberra and we had the opportunity to interview Barry and we were in your, you know, I guess fairly cliche though with a twist trio two blokes and a girl I was the girl but I was also you know insisted on I put my hand up for everything which made it actually quite hard work but insisted on being the, the producer as well as the presenter and no I wasn't going to do gossip I did eco tips you know way ahead of our time and in Canberra that worked because you've got quite an intellectual crowd you've got a very ABC crowd you've got um, a university crowd and you know we did very well and we had Barry Humphreys in one morning and at that stage one of the, I was working with two very you know blokey blokes you know sports and you know underarms and football clubs you know um <laughs> as, the, <laughs> as the old song goes um when barry went into character as dame edna those two guys became deferential they started speaking softly really it, it was extraordinary the impact that he is a performer and the the ability to completely be immersed in a character was extraordinary you know it's it's beyond televisions and gladiolas and even stage performance everybody knew Dame Edna as a fully formed person you know uh not just a a, a cardboard cutout or a caricature sure. or fully three-dimensional three absolutely and these two guys that I was working with like, oh, Dame, it was so funny but then when he went into the um uh the Sir Les Pat Les uh, Patterson, yep. Persona. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Revolting. And this hand started to creep up my thigh, you know. And I, and it wasn't Barry himself. Oh, oh. It was Les. You know? Okay. <laughs> totally in that character. He was just lovely. And afterwards, um, 
later that day there was some big, you know, PR thing and and it had nothing to do with Barry Humphreys, but we were there representing the radio station and Barry was sitting to one side and everyone's having a beer or a wine. And of course, Barry was a sober alcoholic and he's like, Sheridan, would you like a cup of tea? And I was like, oh my God, he remembers my name, you know, this person that I've, you know, idolised my whole life. Um, and people who also managed to capture the, the pathos of their time. So um, Michael Lunig, you know, I grew up with his books as a cartoonist and, you know, that that ability to capture loneliness in a crowd or a sense of nature being bigger than all of us, you know, a sense of, of something more than yeah, he was it, it's an amazing um, artist and um, more than a cartoonist, somebody who really. So, yeah, I have some very unusual. Um... <laughs> well, tell, tell me about your favourite interviews. Yeah. Tell me about the people. That, oh, how about this? Tell me about the people that you most remember, that you uh, fondly mm -hmm. remember the interviews or the meetings or whatever the case is. Yeah. So Barry Humphrey's number one. Um, number two is a woman in Adelaide. I do not know her name. And I had, it, you know, a Triple M. It was, it was all about the music. It was about the fun. It was about the memories and the nostalgia, you know, that goes back to the 70s. And, of course, the 90s had that great uh, revival of grunge rock, which I absolutely love. So I was, I was there for all of that. I think I, I got to Adelaide in 96 and was on air till 2006. And... Um, we had an absolute blast, but I probably became best known for my talkback. And it was very different to a talkback station or to the ABC now where I could have a, a meaningful conversation with someone who rings in. It was, we'd ask a question, it was called phone surfing and we'd chop it all up. So we'd have lots of very quick answers back to back, really fun, short, sharp and shiny. But I remember one day I'd spoken about a song that reminded me of the time I'd travelled to Europe, the very first time I'd travelled as an adult, and the girlfriend I went with at the time, her, her background had some, you know, quite strong emotional challenges and she'd been diagnosed as agoraphobic, so someone who was, you know, fearful and socially phobic, and I, I just mentioned sort of in passing, you know, this song reminds me of my friend who overcame her fears and agoraphobia and we went to Europe together. You know, isn't that amazing? And I played the song. That's all I said. And, David, a week or two later, a woman rang me and she said, oh, Sheridan, when you said that about your friend, I went out my front door and to my letterbox for the first time in five years. I thought if your friend can go to Europe, and I've been living at home too scared to leave the, the house. And that's when I understood the power of the medium. I thought this is, you know, I'm sitting here playing rock and roll and I can say something in 30 seconds that has that capacity to inspire somebody to, you know, go that, go, go that courageous step to be audacious, to, to find a way to, you know, and I'm not saying I'm, you know, Christ-like and can do that with everybody. <laughs> not, if not all my well, listeners you, you are walking can't walk on, on water. water. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. I could go in the water. I'm very obsessed <laughs> with water. Um, but I think that's the power of the medium and it bothers me when people misuse it. So I do have a, I try not to be overly judgmental, but I do have a problem with the kind of whole shock jock, you know, listeners drawn to you like you're a car accident uh, it really troubles me because so much good can be done in that public space you've got a um I guess a responsibility when you have a really large audience and you know I what I learned in working the commercial music side of radio is that um I had to make that difference in a very very limited window of time at the ABC, of course, I was like, oh, my God, I was like a pig in mud. I was in heaven. I could interview everybody and go deep and go meaningful. And and that has been a, a, a really lovely thing. But, you know, if I had to pick a favourite, I couldn't. My, my music career as a music, you know, DJ, FM radio presenter was an absolute delight. And, you know, being with the ABCs, 
allowed me to grow um, intellectually as a person. Um, it's opened doorways to meet phenomenal people. Um, the opportunity to interview people who have also, and this is probably a real theme in my book and my work in general, is people who've been known as one thing or have had to, I guess, face a personal challenge, whether it's the lady who got out her front door after living with agoraphobia and made it to the post box. I mean, that is as big as climbing Everest for a mountain climber, you know. For her, that was huge. Or um, Julia Gillard, our former prime minister, who left under a cloud of all sorts of, you know, sort of chaotic stuff that was going on at the time and has gone on to do some incredible work in the world. If you ever want to listen to an exceptional podcast, um, a podcast of her own, Julia Gillard's podcast, whatever your politics, put all that aside. Oh, no. An extraordinary no, I, woman. Yeah. I, I try really hard to be politically neutral. Uh, I don't like the idea of extreme left, mm -hmm. extreme right. I try to listen to everything and make up my own mind. Yeah, yeah. So I've been very lucky to have interviewed, you know, more people than I could possibly pull names out of a hat in the coming up on 10 years, the nine and a half years that I've been with the ABC. That has been, you know, really something. And probably those moments at Triple M stand out more because there were so few of them. But when they happened, they were really memorable. And we had fun. And, you know, sometimes I can get a little bit too serious. I've got chapters on you know that I can go down this rabbit hole I'm known as a really fun person but I forget to have fun and you know that's where music you know is such a, a great way to to bring your fun back into life and connection and and expression Marcus and I discussed music extensively during the setup uh, for episode nine. This is episode 10, um, as well as in the podcast and then afterwards. I have to ask you, what, what when it comes to music, I'm a, you talked about grunge. You talked about uh, a whole, what, what is your favorite and what is, what, what is your, where does your range go from until? <laughs> Okay, so it goes from classical music. My my family are classical musicians, so, you know, from Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff right through to Led Zeppelin through to... Oh, some of the wow, that's a transition. Music. I know. <laughs> and Plant um, one of my heroes. Oh, Robert Plant, oh, my God. And I <laughs> didn't get introduced to Robert Plant till the... Well, probably the 80s I had um, a principle of moments, so learning about Led Zeppelin was in retrospect for me and Same. I, I remember when I was in Brisbane I was at Triple M Brisbane and I I had free concert tickets to see Plant and Page and kind of like oh yeah and I wandered in late you know the arrogance of getting free stuff and I was <laughs> blown away like they started the concert just the two of them Plant and Page, and it was mesmerizing. Then they had a, a, a lineup around them that was Zeppelin esque, and it was incredible. And then they bring on this Middle Eastern orchestra and did the final part because that had always been such a big influence, that Middle Eastern music. So, you know, go right through to that. Probably some of my favorite, most memorable times on the Sunshine Coast have been doing some of the Woodford broadcasts and meeting people that. I never would have thought I'd get to meet and learn about their careers like Amanda Palmer, um, Buffy St. Marie, you know, people who have had a massive influence on, an, on another part of the planet and here are very niche. And, um, you know, that's been an amazing, you know, a real privilege and an honour and hard work and really satisfying. You're obviously very well read. Tell, me, so tell us about your favourite authors. You know, I've been re-listening to Wind in the Willows, which was one of my favourite books as a child. And when my mum was in the, the palliative phase of her journey, which um, took me away from Adelaide, I went to spend time with her and that sort of segued into going to the ABC. But during that, that um, last few weeks, my sister and I would sit at the, on the ground at the, the foot of her bed and take turns reading Wind in the Willows. So, yeah, recently it came up as a, you know, a free book in one of those streaming services that I, I because audio books, oh, my goodness, you know, just uh, when you're time poor, 
being able to drive or you're going walking the dog, being able to listen to an audio book is an absolute joy. But I found that um, I'm someone who um, is not great at sleep. If you talk about my lack of talent, I'm right there, queen of insomnia. And I thought, well, what can I listen to that is enriching, but it's okay if I fall asleep because I know the story. So I've been li re-listening to Wind in the Willows. And I think it's read by Kenneth, um, <laughs> however you say his name, uh, the actor Kenneth. <laughs> um, and he's wonderful, you know, and it, it, it's a toad of toad hall and <laughs> with his car stealing. And, you know, there's this, it, this lovely, um, you know, world that opens up of these animals where they are so, they anthropomorphize, of course, they're very human, but um, wonderful, wonderful characters. So A. Yeah, a. That's Milne. A random... Did you ever get into A. A. Milne? Yeah, uh, probably. The Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Like, a bit like Led Zeppelin, I got into Winnie the Pooh in my 30s because of the messages, you know, the messaging yeah. and the relationships and, you know, poor old Eeyore with his depression, but how they always included him no matter yes. what. And the sweetness of Piglet and the Piglet with the balloon, you know, and the time the balloon bursts and he, he, he comes and gives. I don't, never worked out if Piglet was a he or a she. They no, come I just, and It was them. ambiguous, I think, deliberately. <laughs> Which is wonderful. Um, it's very, very 2023, but at the time very unique. So Piglet comes and gives who the first balloon and who treats it like the biggest treasure and yeah. suddenly Piglet realises, I'm okay, you know, it was enough. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Did you ever get into fantasy? Totally. So as a old teenager, I was old school fantasy, um, probably more Frank Herbert, so a massive Oh, yes, fantasy. absolutely. And if you, there's a, a chapter in my book where I... I'm having to face some fears and I'm in a, a float tank. So in one of my incarnations, I worked in a float tank centre and they're back in vogue and they are so good and there is one locally and I know it sounds like it, a very... Is that an isolation tank you're talking about? Yeah, an okay, isolation right. tank. So you're, you're floating for those who are unfamiliar. You're in um, it's a sort of sensory deprivation. It's very dark, if you like it like that, and I do, and very quiet and you're you're floating in tons and tons of Epsom salt. So it's like being on the Dead Sea, your body's completely supported. And I needed to have some medical tests and I started uh, chanting the Litany Against Fear from June, from the Bene Jesuit, the nuns in that, that book. Um, you know, I must not fear, fear is a mind killer, fear is a little death. Um, you know, fear is a mind killer that obliterates all. I will face my fear, and I'm paraphrasing probably rather badly. I would allow it to pass over me and through me, and when I turn in the path where the fear is gone, there will be nothing, only I will remain. And it was so soothing. It was something I'd read as a teenager, and, you know, there I am, you know, decades later, still able to lean into that um, as something to, to really draw from as a truth. Um, and I tend to really like there's a name for it and it escapes me at the moment, but when someone creates words that have a universal truth, like the serenity prayer, you know, it doesn't matter what your, um, say, religious background is, the serenity prayer is truth. You know, it just is. Um, yeah, you know, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, it's just so powerful. So um, Rumi, the work of Rumi um, transcends all those different, um, you know, eras and eras and eras. Probably uh, people aren't aware that we're still recording. <laughs> um, you know, transcends thousands of years and from a whole different culture and yet there are these beautiful truths so that's something and I didn't expect to be talking about that tonight but yes you know from fantasy from from uh Frank Herbert to I guess some um, you know works that resonate across the year as a self-help junkie you know everything from Louise Hay in her early work through to um Wayne Dwyer, Dyer um yeah, there's some. Uh, it was a, a very uh, what I call a metaphysical metaphysical maverick by the name of Stuart Wilde. And oh wow! Was, yes, you got into very, Wilde. You know, very cheeky, very naughty, very deferential, but underneath it, you know, this really good heart and 
and the ability to to tap into some universal truths and just say you know you know walk it out you know get up look after yourself you know yeah so so yeah my my literature's nearly as broad as my musical taste which is broad indeed there's one other author I want to ask you whether you've been exposed to before we go on to talk about your book, because I really, really want to talk about your book. And that is Stephen R. Donaldson. You said that you got into uh, fantasy. Uh, did you, are, were you ever exposed to Stephen R. Donaldson? Is that Thomas, Thomas Covenant? Book? Yes, yes. That was amazing, wasn't it? I yeah, have never I been so me. addicted in, in, in a book where, where, you know, it's like 900, 800, oh. 900 pages per book. And there's nine of them. And I remember I'm, starting the first one um, and I was lost. I could smell what was being described. Yeah. I could hear what was being said. I I was there. I was there. And the next thing I realized, it's one in the morning and, and my mom would like bang on the door. Are you still up? Don't you have to work tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm just one more chapter just one next thing I realize it's five o'clock and I'm like one one more chapter and then it's seven <laughs> o'clock and the alarm's ringing and I'm like oh I read all night <laughs> and Thomas was such a great character because he had doubt yes. and um you know like and it was do. so frustrating because we all believed in him and we knew what yes. he had to offer him. You know the the self doubt, and I think that's what made the book so addictive. If you know, I mean, everything you just said, totally, you're 100 percent there. Maybe that's why we're insomniacs because our imagination is. <laughs> There's another one called Incarnations of Immortality and Mordant's mm -hmm. Need. So that's the three. I really recommend anyone who's watching the podcast they find Incarnations of Immortality and Mordant's Need. Blow your mind away. Way. If you enjoyed uh, the adventures, the first Chronicles, second Chronicles, third Chronicles, et cetera, et cetera, you will love, you will love those other ones. Let's talk about your book because I know you want to talk about it. I want to talk about it. What was the motivation? I mean, you have had an extraordinary life. You have done so many things that I didn't know about. Um, and I really enjoy talking about things that nobody else knows about because it, it gives me a point of difference, I suppose. Uh, which is, I guess, a little bit selfish to say that, but okay. Um, I'm just going to admit that I'm a little bit selfish in that regard. Um, what was the motivator uh, to write this book and how did that all come about? Is this something that you were thinking about a long time ago? Um, tell me more. Yeah, yes and no. So many years ago, my brother um, had a prediction. He said, you will write a best-selling self-help book one day. And we're we're going back to you know, late 80s, early 90s when he made this prediction. I don't know if it's a number one bestseller, if it ever will be, but it, I've got an international book deal. So the book's called I Am Enough and it's a contemplation on what it means to have enough, do enough and be enough. And it started from a one-page journal entry. So after I left Adelaide and my best mate Jen and I, you know, didn't ever intentionally dissolve, but our life went in different directions. So we we were no longer writing together. While I was in Mildura, I I met another person who's become one of those lifelong friends, Helen. And Helen invited me spontaneously. She said, I shouldn't do this because I haven't even read your work, but come come to my writers group. And it was, you know, wonderful. And all the writers in it were either published or good enough to be published. And I discovered then I had this little um, idea for a screenplay that Jen and I hadn't worked on. It had been just sitting on my on my desktop for you know years. After a conversation with um, Tim Friedman of the Whitlams, who'd written a song that he's actually re-released recently about Kate Kelly, and I had this idea that I thought would become a screenplay. And that original idea is actually the epilogue of the book. And while I was in Mildura and my I guess my mind was expanding being at the ABC and all the things I got to do there and I got involved in the Mildura Writers Festival and got to meet Thomas Keneally and you know asked him you know like what happens when you write about the descendants of someone and they're really angry with you and he said you know I won't Wait, say you, exactly you what the name said. Thomas Keneally Thomas, do, do you yeah. mean Thomas uh, the son of Darren Keneally 
I mean Thomas Keneally, the Australian author, wrote Schindler's oh, List, etc. Excuse et me, no, I'm amazing. Um, his, uh, uh, I'm giving you a very long answer to come back to I am enough, but um, <laughs> I, I joined this writers group and. All I had was this tiny little e-book idea that I'd written years ago called um, Rut Busters, Breaking Out of Ruts, you know, free and yes. fun and affordable ways to, you know, reinvigorate your life. And um, when, I, when I look back, my writing's evolved since then. But the core, I guess, of, of what later became I Am Enough was probably there. So I threw a few of these things into this writer's group and then I started working on the Kate Kelly book, The Australian Historical Fiction, which you know, is nearly finished. But along the way, lo and behold, we have Black Summer, which, of course, in Queensland started in winter. And being at the ABC, that you know, the broadcasting through emergency broadcasting is something that the ABC does incredibly well and is so important. But I guess I felt it was very hard to switch off, you know, during that period. It was so catastrophic and the devastation to people's lives, to our energy. Um, and then, you know, as the last fire finishes, the pandemic is announced. And I felt like I was constantly emergency broadcasting because every program, whilst everybody's at home and in lockdown, we're working harder than ever in an empty building because everyone else is working from home and myself and my producer or, you know, and this is everyone in the ABC, not just me, not by a long shot, but working very hard to try and get the absolute latest, the, the vital messages across. And at the same time in regional radio, there's no reception. We're also answering the phones in the middle of the program or my producer was trying to get the news coming down the line from um, Brisbane, from the, you know, chief health officer and the, um, uh, you know, the, the heads of everything, getting all of that up to date and at the same time, you know, holding space for people. And I think this is something that um, we all do in our own way, but in radio, we very much at times hold space, you know, sort of hold the community and become that voice of, you know, comfort and reason and connection while people are stuck by themselves. You know, anyone who's ever lived in remote Australia will tell you how important, you know, things like radio national to them are or are to them, Macca on Sunday, you know, who's still doing his thing after all these years. Um, they become important relationships in their life. Anyway, um, throughout all of that, there was also changes, you know, within the ABC and some changes that I wasn't um, particularly happy about with a program change for me. You know, the person had absolute, you know, they're the boss, they got the right to, to make changes, but I, I wasn't in a very good space to accept that change I did my level best and embraced the other program and it was a good show but I, I wrote a one-page journal entry um, about how I was feeling that you know recognizing that I I had become my own taskmaster and that you know what did it mean to have enough do enough and be enough that that mantra started to emerge it started as just writing the word enough in cursive um in my journal and then this one page appeared and the next day at the end of my program I had a a lovely thing called mindful monday um just before the 11 o'clock news and I'd invited a author, a mindfulness author, onto the program. And because it was the last interview of the day, I then went into the news and took the station off the air and it goes over to another studio and we kept chatting and she knew one of my colleagues and she said, I hear you're a writer also. What are you working on? And I said, oh, I've been working on Australian historical fiction for the last seven years. I said, but last night I wrote this journal entry it feels important. It feels like a book. It feels like now. And when I told her the, the sort of the, the concept, I have enough, I do enough, I am enough, she said, that is so now. That is, you know, the zeitgeist, the, you know, what people need. You need to pitch it and you need to pitch it now. I said, I can't. It's one page. You know, I haven't even got an outline. I haven't, you know, haven't done she your said, synopsis yes, or anything. No, nothing, nothing. So I didn't quite act on it that quickly, but I wrote just another piece or two. I had about two and a half pages and I wrote to the publisher she, she suggested and I had like a little 
tiny paragraph on who I was, the name of the book, and what it was about. Another tiny paragraph, and I attached these two and a half pages of writing. And then I went and made a cup of tea, and I thought, well, I shouldn't just send it to one. I'll send it to three because three's got a nice synergy. And when I got back to my computer, I'd already had a response from the publisher in London who had passed it on to one of her colleagues. She said, we don't do this, I only do Illustrator, but I'm sending it to this person. Then that person messaged me and I'll never forget it. She said, Sheridan, I had a million things to do today, but when I saw the title of your book, I had to stop and read it. I love your writing. Can we talk? Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, it was beautiful. So I pinged it off to the two other publishing houses. <laughs> yep. Within a couple of days, all three had got back saying they wanted more. And it was so flattering, David, because two out of the three did not take unsolicited work. Um, probably being from the ABC helped them kind of bother yeah. to open the email. <laughs> um, you got to use what you've got in this life, yeah, my absolutely. friend. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. But then I knew I was onto something. And then I kind of had to make it up really quickly because it's like we want the synopsis, we want the full, you know, book proposal, which is a body of work in, in itself. And I ended up going with that original one, the, the publishers in London, because A, it was an international book deal. So, you know, I'm going to go with that, aren't I? Um, however, it was really the way that particular Um, head of that department at the time. She's no longer there, unfortunately, but she's off doing other amazing things. The way she wrote to me allowed me to very easily know what what, what the next step was. And I thought, my goodness, I hope this woman's also an editor because I really, she really gets where I'm coming from. And and I think that's such an important relationship. You know, there's so many people who are afraid of going forward with their creative works because they are afraid of being shamed or embarrassed or that it's going to be edited to death. And I feel very, very blessed indeed that I came across her and then the ethos of that particular company, even when she um, parted ways with them, they picked up the reins and they were very honourable in the way they they worked with me. It was yeah. lovely. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Okay, so can you give us a overview? Can you give us a mm-hmm. overview of what this is about? Who is it for? Is it for ladies? Is it for men? Is it for whoever? Is it for everybody and anybody? What is your amazing book about, in your own words? Okay, so I'm Enough is actually, it came from this idea I had in this one page journal entry where I decided to put myself on a 90-day challenge, not to go and do someone else's workshop or course or read another book. I was going to create a 90-day challenge. I had, um, after spending about three or four years for the first time in my adult life at, at an ideal weight, and anyone who's ever struggled with their weight or size or body image will know how painful all of that is. Um, and I was blowing it, you know, after after finding something that worked really well for me and sticking with it and maintaining a, a you know, an, a sort of right size body. Uh, I, I never at the time recognized it. I always thought I had to be smaller and smaller and smaller. I was fading away, but I started, um, I guess I come from the cafe generation, David, where we meet and eat in cafes, you know, daily, sometimes more than once. And I love it. Cake. It's my favorite thing to do. And you have to Just one word, say, cake. <laughs> Yeah, bacon. Um, <laughs> Calzone. Oh, my God. Weak at the name. And anyway, I'd started putting on weight, plus I'd also come into a an inheritance and, you know, quite frankly, I was worried I was eating it. And my my husband, and look, this was a massive risk. This could have ended in the D-R-B-O-R-C-E. He said, you know, maybe you want to have a look at your spending and see where it's going, you know. I think you might find you're eating your money. Anyway. Is that the last time anyone saw him alive? (laughs) Just about. I had, you know, like my my hackles were up. I felt very defensive. But being a self-help junkie, I knew that um, being defensive meant there was something for me to look at. Yeah, And so I actually went and I did have a look at his um, suggestion. I went, I did a forensic dive into my bank accounts back three months. And sure enough, I was eating out a lot. 
So that was one thing. But I also spotted some other spending, and it, it was probably particular to the pandemic where I was broadcasting and working harder than ever, but, you know, talking to people about how there's all these free online courses and, and everyone was inspired to, you know, do things they'd always wanted to do because finally they're at home with their kids or their dog and they can pick up the guitar or they can do a course in online or whatever. And I'd bought myself a podcasting course. I still don't have a podcast. I'm working on it, but $999. And the damn thing expired before I could use it. And it was run by a radio broadcaster. So I write this letter going, oh, I'm with the ABC and I've been doing emergency broadcasting and can't please have more time. And one of her minions wrote back going, no, but for just another $89.99 a month. And I was like, no, <laughs> these people do not buy pre-recorded courses and that have an expiry date. The people yeah. have done the work there. You should own it forever. Yeah, anyway, I agree, that was, 100%. You know, that's something I have a, an issue with is that evergreen work you know, if you create an online course and someone buys it, if there's not a live element, then they bought it, they own it. Don't take I, it off the market. No, you get no argument from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I looked at that and I was also very aware that I was overworking and I began to become aware of my part in that, not to blame the organisation or to blame the pandemic or whatever. Why was it that I never felt like I'd done enough? Why did I keep going? Why could not I go home from work on time? So I came up with a challenge that for 90 days I would um, uh, no cafes and restaurants. That was number one. Number two was no non-essential spending. So no podcasting courses or crazy things that pop up online that seem like essential things or, or whatever, none of that, and that I would go home from work on time. And that became the core of the book. And as I was going through that 90 days, I was contemplating, you know, what that really meant. What does it mean to have enough? What does it mean to do enough? And ultimately to learn how, you know, to be enough. I am enough. You are enough. And I just kept hearing it all around me. Nobody seemed to ever feel like they were enough. You know, some of them knew they did enough. Some of them knew they had enough. But even then, you know, this amount of waste that we, we have in our lives. So it was really, I guess, an exercise in leaning into what we already have and leaning in with, you know, gratitude and appreciation and looking at where do we draw our um, true contentment from. And when I investigated those stories from my childhood and different points in my life and, you know, things I was seeing during the pandemic, the, the nature, uh, the answer was nearly always nature, you know, nature and then creativity and connection. So, you know, you get to know me far better than you'd ever want to. I'm, I'm a very transparent person when it comes to, it wasn't really until I'd press send on the final draft and they were like, yep, we're really happy that I went, oh, my God. God, is this the most self-indulgent thing that anyone on the planet has ever written? Um, <laughs> it was, you know, it, it just went into all different areas, you know, and right at the heart of it, David, is my amazing friend, Mel D. Dizeldi. Mel was a broadcaster and a radio executive in, um, in, in Adelaide and near she's, Adelaide. She's one of my wife's heroes. Uh, she was a beautiful, beautiful soul. And Mel had always been a, a lovely person and a great mate, but in facing not one but two terminal illnesses and in ultimately in facing her death, we lost her just before Christmas last year, um, she became extraordinary. And I was thinking about this the other day. I would walk with Mel. Mel did this beautiful thing that as she became um, sort of bedridden and uh, unable to get out and about, instead of wanting to, you know, not see that everyone else was out there without her, she's like, please take me with you, you know, send me a video. And people were sending, you know, clips to her from around the world. And I would take her to the beach every day and, you know, send her little messages and we'll ping backwards and forwards and sometimes we'd talk and I would contemplate, you know, the you know, what was going on for me and what I was learning from her. And I, I, I still do, you know, I still contemplate um, how much I learned from Mel. And uh, to best capture it, you know, how we talk about a cup half full person. Mel, there, you could have an empty cup with a molecule of water and she would find a way to concentrate on that one molecule of water and go, life is good. 
nice. I am grateful. Nice. You know, she was, she just had, and not all of us have that capacity, but we can aspire to get a little bit closer to it. We can aspire to, you know, when she'd already been dealing with um, stage four terminal cancer for, <clears throat> yeah. for many years when she yeah. was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. And she rang me three days after the diagnosis and she was laughing and how are you? And, and always asked about you, you know, how are you, David? You know, what was your day like? And I'm yeah. like, my day, nothing. You're yeah. like, you know, you've got all these terrible things yep. going on. And, um, yeah, she she never lost sight of that. The the gratitude in that woman was extraordinary. And she said to me, oh, I, I have had my three-day pity party, three days for motor neuron disease when you're already dealing with terminal cancer. And she goes, and I'm over it. You know, I'm, I've maybe got a shorter life. I'm paraphrasing now. Um but I have to make the most of every moment. And, of course, there were days where she couldn't and probably, you know, only her her partner, Chris, would and her, perhaps her, her son would really know how hard those days got um, and she'd go to ground. But, you know, she, she described to me how she would just look at the light coming in through a crack in the curtains in intensive care and just focus on that light. You know, like Darren, I imagine this is something that's changed radically, radically changed lives all over the world. What feedback have you had? Uh -huh. um, look, people, the, the feedback's been fascinating in its consistency. So you asked who was it for. It's a midlife woman's book, so I imagined other midlife women. It's been a lot broader than that. A lot of younger people are picking up. A lot of men are enjoying it. Um which surprised me. Predominantly, I do get contacted by midlife women. And rather than, I didn't want to get sort of caught up in sales figures. I've got no idea how it sold. I didn't want to get caught up in online reviews of algorithms that can be thrown by one hater or somebody who picks it up and it's just not for them. And then suddenly the whole thing comes crashing down from four stars to two stars or, you know, I just didn't want to put myself through that. But what has happened organically is people, and this is so um, uh, such an honour, is that people have gone, and I didn't even have a, a website until very recently, got a little tiny sort of landing page, but people were going out of their way to hunt me down on, you know, Facebook or Instagram, and that was new to me as well, Instagram anyway, uh, and send me a message saying what the book meant to them, and that has been consistent, you know, men, women, different ages it's been a very consistent I felt like you wrote this book for me this could have been about me and uh, and some of them have asked how Mel is and I've had to let them know that she's no longer with us but they've said I felt like through your friendship with her uh, which is woven lightly through the book it's not it's not um, weighted that way but it certainly gave beautiful depth and and the contemplation of, of life and death and loss and and what remains, you know, the connection that remains even after we've lost somebody. Um, you know, Mel's very much, very much still with me. I learned an awful lot. There's only one time in my life that I wrote a screenplay. It was an adaptation of DOA, Dead on Arrival, which is a 1930s, I think it was late 30s, early 40s, something like that. So I adapted it and made it into a screenplay. And I learned a lot about myself. What did you learn through writing this amazing book that you've just been describing? Well, I mean, it's going to sound cheesy, but I learned that I really do have enough. I actually have more than enough. And I, whilst I've never been rich, that doesn't seem to matter how much, how little or how much money I have. I've had the same mindset about um, money and that's not really served me very well. So leaning into what I already have, um, I actually now do know when I've done enough. Uh, I, I will, you know, I will backslide, absolutely. Don't always know when I've eaten enough. Um, still working on that one, Life, lifetime <laughs> mission. But I'm, I think, applying, I had to really walk my talk. And then when it came out, there was another whole level of walking my talk of, wow, people are reading this. And, and you know, I, it's, it's not a straight line. It's, a, you know, a very much a roller coaster journey. But during the, the editing part of the book and, the, and all the different publishing process, 
they were in London, I'm here, they'd had a change of CEO, there were things going on, the timeline was all pushed out of shape and there were um, there was nothing I could do except respond to the next set of instructions. And I've kept that up rather than always thinking I need to be ahead of the game, I need to be pushing myself out there, I need to climb the next mountain. It's like, no, what is the next step? What does, in this case, the, the publisher need from me? What do the promoters need from me? What does David need from me today? You know, he needs me to make this time to get in a bit early to see if we can make the technology work to give of myself and my story. This is what's needed of me. So this is what I do. And I've become much better at letting everything else go and not chasing more. Um, it doesn't mean I'm without ambition. I would love, um, of course, to have a best-selling book. I would love to have a follow-up. I've written 109 chapter starters and thought starters and ideas. So I'm presuming there's going to be a follow-up because I'm writing it. So, you know, one way or another, I guess that will happen. Um, keep being audacious, but at the same time, recognise when it's enough. And when I'm I'm noticing the signs when I'm adrenalised that that's not a good thing. I used to run on it and it's actually, you know, one of the reasons I can't sleep, one of the reasons I can't slow down and I will go and throw myself in the ocean or go for a walk um, with the dog or with Mel, you know, with Mel's memory and just take that time, connect with nature um, and stop. You know, last week I was not feeling 100% on Monday. I'd had this amazing weekend, but I, one morning I woke up at 1.30 and the next morning I had a live broadcast for the Queensland Garden Expo, which is incredible. And I got to work with, you know, Costa and all these great people from Gardening Australia and the Who's Who, and it was so exciting. And I got to Monday and I just was feeling a bit under the weather. I spent a whole day in bed, you know. I wasn't sick. It's the sort of day that I'd normally push through and go to work anyway, but I... I didn't want to become sick and I just took a day off. And the next so day, it was a recovery day? It was a recovery day. I'd yeah, reset. We all I need ready them. To go. And we all the need next them. day, I had a, a wonderfully productive day, but I also went for a swim and walked on the beach. And I'm honoring that. And also, I think beyond just it, it can sound like a very like self focused thing to give yourself that time but it's also a, a point of gratitude and appreciation. You know, we live surrounded by um, nature, by amazing people. If we don't stop and appreciate, then what is it all for? You know, it's nobody cares about my bank balance except, you know, the tax man and, you know, me on a bad day. But everybody can appreciate you know, what has been given to us just by, you know, being on the planet, really. You know. And I live somewhere now where I can swim all year round. Most people still call me a southerner because I don't wear a wetsuit. It's not that cold. You know, it's beautiful. In fact, last year I was down in South Australia in winter. I swam at Port Elliot. Now, that was cold. In winter? But, <laughs> I know. But look, you know, athletes are paying a fortune to have an ice bath. Why wouldn't I throw myself in the, the water there at, um, at Port Elliot? It was magnificent and invigorating, David. Invigorating is the word. <laughs> that, that reminds me of a time when my uh, niece, not legal niece, but adopted niece, my niece went over mm -hmm. to Hamburg in Germany and uh, was an exchange student staying with the, I shouldn't say the last name, but with that family. And she came to Australia and stayed with my sister. And we were down at Magnetic Island and it was the middle of winter and I was freezing and I've got a reasonable tolerance. But she's like, oh, no, David, I, I feel like going for a swim. And I'm just like, oh, Anka, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I totally get it. And I'm, I'm trying to embrace all oceans whenever I get a chance. So, yeah, that's that's what I've learned in trying to trying my best to walk my talk I don't always succeed of course not um and really recognizing that perfectionism comparison these are things that get us in a lot of trouble things that I used to worry about I no longer worry about it has been an astonishing night filled with all kinds of interesting tidbits and whatever else I have to ask you before we actually go where do you see yourself in five years time oh 
goodness me. I was thinking about this very question recently um, and the, the short answer is I don't know. You know, so many things are changing. I have fantasies of, you know, where I might be in five years' time. I hope I can find contentment. I hope that, um, you know, that, that through some of my words, whether it's broadcasting or I am enough, the book, um, or, or, or version know, two, which you're working on podcasts like this. Yes. Um, that, that, you know, that continues to resonate with people. Um, I feel very fortuitous to have a couple of times in my life been in the right place at the right time and to have had something to offer that seems to connect with the world. It's none of us are for everybody. You know, there's, there's no way that, everybody who reads a book is going to go, oh, my God, it's not a perfect book. There are things I would do a little differently. Um, you know, there have been challenges along the way, but I have learned that, you know, that, that to, to, to just go, this is enough. You know, each time someone contacts me and lets me know what it meant to them to read that book, I just let that be enough, you know. There's, you know, Things are out of my control, you know, whether it becomes a bestseller, whether I get a, a bite, a second bite at the cherry and get to deliver the second book. I assume so because I'm writing it. So that's the audacious part of me. Um, where I'd like to be in the next five years is with less struggle and less challenge, you know, less pushing against what the universe is offering. That's a that's a really profound answer. Uh, I really yeah. like what you said. Um, what, if someone is struggling right now, I mean, I mean, really struggling. What pearls of wisdom can you offer from <laughs> your book um, that will really um, help them to be able to carpe diem, or in another way of mm -hmm. putting it, which is a favorite of mine, it's it hangs over uh, the uh, pantry in my kitchen, um, and it says, "Don't count the days; make the days count." So what words of wisdom can you impart that's going to inspire, that's going to transform, that's going to be a, a kickstart, if you like, uh, for a person who's stuck? There's a uh, an author, an American, no, Canadian uh, woman who does a lot of work in the sort of you know, spiritual field, uh, meditation, all that sort of thing. And for a long time, she had these fantastic journals. And when she said she was going to stop making them, I was like, you know, I scraped all my pennies together and bought like a whole bunch of them. And then I kept giving them away. So I'm on my second last one at the moment. And, you know, and anyway, she has this great saying, which is, what will I do to feel the way I want to feel. Oh, I love and that. And I love that. I love you know, that. Because instantly it's like it gives us an action and it takes back mm. some control, some sense of responsibility instead of going, you know, whatever it is that has got us discombobulated, whatever difficulties life have thrown us, whether it is, you know, like Mel dealing with a, a really difficult diagnosis and not knowing how long your time on the planet is, even more so. But you know, for each of us, it's amazing what throws us out. You know, I've, I've had my nose out of joint over things that other people would sail through that I've sailed through at other times, but that kind of perfect storm of circumstances has, um, you know, has me, has left me kind of thrown off course. So that's what I ask myself, particularly when I'm overly tired, which is, you know, more often than I'd like. That's where I want to be in five years of sleep. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sleeping eight hours. Like, please, please let that happen. Um, that would be so good. But what can I do in this moment to feel the way I want to feel? Not how I feel, but to perhaps take myself a step closer. And look, for me, David, that nearly always is something to do with movement, to physically don't just sit there and, you know, stewing my own juices so to speak but you know get up do something that's a little outside myself and connect with the the, the world of nature I know I've, I've come back to that a few times but it makes such a difference throw myself in that icy cold ocean you know walk the dog because you know he's going to appreciate it even if I don't feel like it but what will I do to feel the way I want to feel there are some things that when we do them 
we never regret them, even though they're hard to do and exercise fits into that category. Um, maybe we're resisting the fact that we need to pause and, and meditate or pray or whatever your personal practice is. Um, coming up with some personal practices that you do regularly so that you create those neural pathways that even on a hard day, especially on a hard day, you leaning. I know that if I haven't had enough sleep, I need to, you know, plan my meals so that they're a bit nutritious so that I don't just fall into the carb up and sugar up to keep going because then you crash and you feel worse. What am I going to do to feel the way I want to feel? So big thank you to Danielle Laporte for, for phrasing it that way because it's something that um, never fails to work for me. And, you know, sometimes it's not instant, but if I, if I really think about it, and then take that action, whatever it is, um, it always works. I've also found, just adding to what you've said, I also found uh, that for myself, if I ever get down and low and whatever else, uh, I find that going out into the sunlight with that vitamin D that's absolutely for free, uh, you don't have to take any supplements. Um, and I find that uh, having a vigorous walk really helps me. Is that something that helps you as well? Yeah, absolutely. The movement and the sunshine, like I think one of the reasons I love my time in Mildura and even I did a stint in Tamworth is big sky countries. And I lived in the Adelaide Hills, which was beautiful, but I was in a valley on top of a mountain or on top of the range. So there's the sun. I missed that bit. I missed that bit. And I, I actually found that really challenging. I'd run around lighting candles and coloured lights and all sorts of things, but nothing works like sunlight. So absolutely, if you can get out and get sunlight, it's, it's, an, it's a reset and even better if you can walk or roll or swim or whatever your body will let you do, even if it's like Mel just lying there looking at that crack of sun coming through the curtains and see if you can get someone to open the curtains you know, a bit wider for you if you're in a position where you can't do it for yourself. Um, and that is another, another really important thing. I think we underestimate the power of support and particularly people in leadership roles, people who are, you know, used to carrying, carrying others or carer roles even or anything where others are dependent on us, we get in our own way when we need help. You know, we're the ones that normally carry everybody else and I think that's um, something we need to as a, a culture learn that asking for support how to ask for support and whom to ask it from not to be disappointed if the first person you ask just lets you down because I can't do it because it's not everyone does it in their own way and when I know when my mum was dying I was really surprised by who wasn't able to support me you know um, yeah, assumptions I'd made about people and, and how they offer support. But over time, I've come to recognise that different people have different things to offer. You know, like I know what I'm really good at in the way of supporting others. I also know what I, I can't do or what is not my strength. So I try and give others that same grace. But please, please, please make sure you've got a cheer squad, that you've got someone in your corner and don't think you have to go it alone because you literally don't. And if you have no one, if you're listening to me going, Sheridan, you don't know me, I've got no one, then, you know, there are so many resources available to us. David, I know that, you know, this has been a new and interesting experience doing your podcast via, well, you. Um, you know, not being in the same room together, being in different that, that's states. That's strange. And, <laughs> We jumped on this afternoon, we tested it, we thought it was all going to go live, it didn't go live, we thought, no, let's make the best of the moment, we've, we've pushed through, we've stopped a couple of times, we've started again, we've persisted, um, I hope it's been worth it. It's um, been extraordinary on my part. We, we've got to know each other a little better because of it and, you know, here we are online and as much as, and uh, there's a lot of things I dislike or don't feel good about with social media and what it promotes but it does mean that even if you're bedridden there's a good chance that you can connect with somebody somewhere in the world you know one of my closest friends um shout out to Ann Wax in Seattle uh or near Seattle in Washington state we met because she couldn't sleep and she she jumped in an online community that we were both um 
part of at the time and said, is there anyone in these countries who might be awake when I'm asleep that I can get a little bit of support from? And, you know, seven years down the track, we're actually going to see each other for the first time in the flesh in How Hawaii. Awesome is that? In That's fantastic. How cool you, is that? You yeah. must be so looking forward to that. I'm so excited. My, <laughs> my sister and I, we're going on a sibling trip. I hope my brother can join us. We're going to scatter some of mum's ashes in the place we lived in our childhood. We didn't get to that part because, you know, we've already gone way over time, David. Oh, I'm so sorry. Another time. <laughs> That's another four or five uh, podcast. Just before we go, Jennifer Harris will not forgive either of us if we don't shout out to Jennifer Harris. Would you, would you say hi to Jen? Absolutely. Hey, Jen, thank you so much for connecting me with David. Marcus, thank you so much for the world's best publicity shot. I can't use it anymore because it's like over a decade old, so I feel like it would be false advertising. The photo Marcus took of me, did hair, makeup, still to this day my all-time favourite photo. It captures this great vivacious sense of fun that I can only hope to, you know, emulate uh, in my life. He was so much fun to work with and such a joy. So I really enjoyed your podcast with him and very much look forward to seeing you and Jen and Marcus, you know, in the flesh, in the not too distant future. Um, Adelaide, I'm coming back. Woo! Now, just before we go, where can we get this outrageously good book? Where, what bookstores carry it? Amazon, et cetera, et cetera? It's, look, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, in Australia, it came out in January and literally it was everywhere. If you do get it, please send me a selfie of your uh, picture of yourself with the book um, and where you got it from because it is so much fun finding out. A friend from uh, Mildura sent me a picture of the book next to Grace Tame's book in Mackay at the airport. It's at Adelaide Airport. Um, yeah, apparently a friend of mine from Sydney was visiting my other friend in Adelaide and the, the woman at the airport said this one just keeps going off the shelves. So thank you for everyone who's bought it so far. And, um, you know, for everyone who's considering buying it, it's also available on um, Audible and it's available on Kindle. It's there as an e-book. I personally like the hard copy because it's like I like the affirmation of it, you know, that, that I can look at that. If yep. you can't afford a copy, let me know and I will send you a postcard so that you can have that affirmation and, you know, stick it up somewhere in your house. So do this contact me. This has been an outrageously good evening. Thank you so much for Thank taking you. so much of your invaluable time uh, to come on the, an unknown podcast. My last question before you, before we go, why? Just out of curiosity, uh, was it your relationship with Jennifer? Was it your relationship with Marcus? Why would you go on an unknown podcast that mm. is only literally done 10 podcasts? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> Um, look, I'm a fairly intuitive person, so if I get a good feeling about something, I will say yes, and I'm also learning when to say no. Um, I important. didn't know Marcus was going to do the podcast, so I hadn't been in touch with him when I'd already agreed to do it. But um, Jenny reached out and she, you know, told me about your, you know, the, what what inspired you and, and the that you really wanted to connect with people. She thought my book might be something that you'd be interested in. And I had a look at the episode that, you know, she did on, on the struggles of, of living, um, you know, without secure, secure accommodation. You know, the homelessness crisis at the moment is massive and it is everywhere. And uh, people who've never been homeless before are experiencing homelessness for the first time. So, you know, there's, there's some real challenges that people are going through that many of us you know are lucky enough to not know about but we need to know about because we can't um we can't know how to help if we don't know about something so i i you know really appreciate jenny for shedding light on you know what that can be like there are so many really simple ways we can help. It's something I really focus on in, in my radio program at the moment because I'm doing a Saturday program and it's very sort of lifestyle and connected. But again, like I said about the loneliness, we have a loneliness epidemic. There are things you can join. You can at least try, even if I'm not a joiner, I don't like groups, I don't want to belong to this and I don't want to sign up for that. Just, you know, open your mind, open your heart, go check something out. And you never know when you're going to make a new best friend. 
Thank you, Best Friend David. Thank you so much for an outrageously good night. Sheridan Stewart, the one, the only, all the way from Queensland uh, via the internet uh, on the David Wilberton podcast. Please do tune in next week. Love to see you. Look forward to seeing you. And uh, that's it for tonight. Good evening and welcome to television. We're happy little veggie mites, as bright as bright can be. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. I like aeroplane jelly. Milk, thanks. Low fat, no fat, full cream, high calcium, high protein soy, light skim, omega 3, high calcium with vitamin D and folate or extra dollop. On the largest network of stations across Australia, this is Countdown. It's going to be Australia too. They are going to win. Tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up to die is a bum. They call me Caramello. Koala. Not happy, Jen! Please explain.